I want you to leave here this morning with, are you willing to change the world? We're going to be talking about this month, especially within with what we're doing in a practical level with the pay down mortgage deal. We are going to be talking about being all in. Say all in. All in. My Lord, I'm going to have to put some power into this. Say all in. All in. You see, when, when, when you begin to, I love that video. I'm going to show that every week uh, uh, this month because I, it needs to penetrate our minds. What has God called us to do? Oftentimes we forget. We grow weary in well-doing. We get distracted. Life happens. Say amen. Amen. You see, things come up unexpectedly. Loss of jobs, car breaks down, water heater goes, family dilemmas, all kinds of things. And, and, and all of that gets in the way and diminishes, presses in, causes us to forget that we have been called for a higher purpose. We've been called for more. But it's hard to believe that. It's hard to walk in that. We begin to hedge ourselves. We begin to hem ourselves. We begin to uh, circle the wagons as it is to protect ourselves from, from whatever. The, we fear what we don't know. And we forget that we've been called to change the world. So on the first Sunday of this little series of mine, All In, we chose Communion Sunday. There cannot be a greater illustration, life example, picture, any more perfect than that of Jesus Christ when it comes to understanding what does it mean to live all in. Because when we partake of the element this morning, representation of his broken body, representation of his spilled blood, he gave everything. Amen? If he, no one can deny that Jesus Christ lived all in. Now here's the problem with this word because oftentimes we get, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, we limit what we how to understand the things of God because of things we we you know don't do. We are not a gambling church. We don't believe in gambling, and the Bible has a lot to say about what happens with those who uh, want to uh, try to make increase off of gambling. The risk takers. I grew up down by Atlantic City. I can tell you what the promise of Atlantic City was. And I can tell you that if you go outside of two blocks of Atlantic City, you'll see a promise that has never been kept. You will see lives that have been shattered. You will see people combing the sands, homeless, lost their marriages, lost their homes, their jobs. They lost their life savings, all for a promise of but the next hand. And so they go... So we're not talking about that. We'll give you the definition of all in a moment, but there's no Boudreaux this morning, but I do have a little story for you. There was a man who got lost in the desert, and after wandering around for a long time, his throat became very dry. About the time he saw a, a little shack off in the distance, so he made his way to the shack and he found a water pump with a small jug of water and a simple note. The note read, pour all the water into the top of the pump to prime it. If you do this, you will get all the water you need. Now the man had a choice to make. If he trusted the note and poured the water in and it worked, he would have all the water he needed. But if it didn't work, he'd still be thirsty and have no water. He could die. So he could choose to drink this water now and have immediate satisfaction, but it might not be enough and still he might die. After thinking about it for a little while, the man decided to take a risk and put it all in. He poured the entire jug into the pump and it began to work the handle. At first, nothing happened. He got a little scared and kept going and water started coming out. So much water was coming out that it filled all the containers he could find in the area. So much water came out that not, not only was he able to fill all the jugs, he was able to drink to his heart's content. He was able to shower and to, and to refresh himself with all this beautiful water. He was willing to give up momentary satisfaction and ended up getting more water than he ever needed. The note also said, after you have finished, please refill the jug for the next traveler. The man refilled the jug and added this note. 
Please prime the pump. Believe me, it works. You see, if he chose not to, if he chose to believe uh, his, uh, his short-sightedness, his immediate need, if he chose to, to uh, uh, surrender to what's now instead of what could possibly be, he would not have poured it all in. Pouring half in wouldn't have worked. Pouring some in wouldn't work. It had to be all or... You see, we have a problem sometimes when it comes to our relationship with God and communion becomes just an exercise. Uh, it becomes a tradition. It becomes a ritual. And we forget that every time we partake of communion, we are reminded again of the one who went all in for us. All in. In fact, the scripture we read this morning in Mark, when we get there, you'll see that, and I love how Pastor already got it, not only did Jesus talk about him being all in, but then he throws a little thing on the back end. We also have to be all in. All in, all in is widely understood as a poker term, wagering your entire stack or your stake. Also, to, it's to be understood as giving without restriction or living without restriction. With everything included, nothing held back. This is important for us to, to really understand the ramification when Jesus calls us to live in such a way. The opposite of being all in is this, holding back, holding out, half-hearted or double-minded. In fact, what does the scripture say about being double-minded? In James chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, he says, but when you ask, he's talking about prayer, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. That is not a good picture. That is not a good description of an individual. Someone who claims to be a Christ follower. Someone who claims that I have surrendered all. Someone who says, uh, all to Jesus, I surrender. Someone who says, Father, take my life and do whatever you will with it. You see, you've seen waves. You go into the ocean. You've seen them. You've been on a, maybe on a little boat, a sailboat or something, a fluid kind. You don't want to be the kind that's just uh, hung on every wind that comes by. We have people who live their Christian life that way. They don't dig into the scriptures. They don't see what the scriptures say for themselves. They put their finger out there and they wonder where's the prevailing wind and they follow that thought. Unstable in all they will do. And I, and I find this interesting because he's point blank here. How can you be half-hearted? How can you be double-minded and still expect to get? <laughs> Still expect to receive from the Lord. He doesn't leave it, you know, up for opinion and up for question. He says, do not expect to receive anything that you're asking. Pretty clear. A lot of people run around, I don't know why my prayers aren't answered, Pastor. Dude. <laughs> I won't say that. The reality is when we when we begin to understand. Maybe we're double-minded. And today we're not going to try to, you know, beat up people over the head and say, you're a God, you're a... No, recognize where you're at and move towards where God wants us to be. Amen. So the big point today is this. I'm going to begin with the big point. Christian life of complete surrender, all in, say all in. All in. Shouldn't be viewed as radical, but normal. Isn't that sad nowadays? Oh, we'll go read that book of that person who really, really went out of his way to be really super strong for God. We'll, we'll run to that testimony, that story, or that, that little something that someone put together, a video, and it's like a story of somebody who really did, and we say, oh, that's so crazy. That's amazing. I could never, no one has ever, and we elevate them as something to be like an anomaly, when in fact, and that's why we're going to show that video every week, and thank God no one's sitting in the front. I'm spitting like crazy. <laughs> you get an anointing if you sit here. The thing is, is when I'm going to show that video because I get energized every time I see that video. I need to be reminded what God wants from me. What I can be as a son of God, as a child of God, as a daughter of God. We need to understand this ain't what, this ain't it. We've not arrived. We've just only begun. 
and it requires a surrendered life. And we should realize that that kind of living isn't radical. It's normal. It's only radical because we've so abnormalized it. You see, we all have made the bubble normal being what actually God would consider abnormal or immature. So we lowered it, and God says, no, lift this thing up. So I want us to understand what all in Christianity requires, and there's quite a few things, but I'm only going to jump to the theme verse today, and that is in Mark. Mark chapter 8, you can turn there, please. We ought to be exercising our word today. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, 31 to 37. I'm reading from the NIV. <coughs> During the next couple of weeks, we'll look at all in various points of it. But it begins from this. If we don't understand this, then really everything else is just, you know, pointless. All in Christianity requires a life of surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Say Lordship. Lordship. And I got a couple of quotes that are going to stun you this morning because we have actually changed the definition of Lordship or at least the practice of it. The, we, we've, uh, we've at one time professed Jesus to be Lord of all and then with our lives and lips we demonstrate otherwise. But let's read the text again fresh. It says, He then began to teach them that's his disciples, that the Son of Man, that is himself, Jesus, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. Get the context for a moment, okay? Let's just take, you know, we're a bunch of people hanging around with, you know, the CEO of this wonderful little brand new fledgling company. We've got the status, you know, the, the, the politicians all up in a roar. Ah, you know, who's that Jesus? We got the crowd singing his praises. Go Jesus, go Jesus, right? We're getting free food. I mean, we're just seeing some wonderful, amazing stuff. We're dumbfounded because every now and again we get to do something out of the ordinary of our life, right? And he's sitting down with us and has this little conversation. Okay, boys, this is what's going to happen. Oh, you already know they hate me. Oh, they're going to really hate me. They're going to turn me over. It's going to be a bootleg court situ situation. That's all going to be illegal and under the table. I'm adding all that because I know the rest of the story, right? He says to them, they're going to hand me over. They are going to destroy me. One of the things you need to understand about all in is this. People that live all in, they can do so because they know who they are and what they're supposed to be doing. Their life is not dictated by circumstance. It doesn't matter the situation. It doesn't change. It doesn't matter public opinion. It doesn't matter even what their own little conflict may be like Jesus in the garden. Remember that. If there's any other way, but nevertheless, not my will. Jesus knew why he came. Jesus volunteered. He said, I will go. The Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. It was already set to happen, and it's now being played out in reality, in physical form. So your boss is sitting there telling you, hey guys, I'm going to die. Can you imagine how you'd be feeling? Wait a minute here. All this is happening because of the big guy. Right? Pretty cool. I'm enjoying it. Got a little notoriety. A little fighting amongst us. Who's number two? Right? He's going to die? What about me, boss? They start wondering. They start thinking. Can you think about that instability, the fear, the apprehension that starts to well up? And our favorite character... Peter speaks up. <laughs> and he says, he's so plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? <laughs> hey, Jesus. <laughs> Do you, uh, what, what, did you eat this morning? I mean, what's happening? Low blood sugar? Uh, you know, what, something, what, what's going on? You're going to die? No, you're not going to die. That's the nice version. You out of your mind? What are you doing running around telling people you're going to die? Who do you think you are anyway? <laughs> he 
rebukes him, however and whatever it is. And then Jesus turned and looked at his disciples and he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan. He didn't call Peter Satan. He recognized the influence that, Satan, uh, that Peter was speaking from wasn't of God, it was of the world. Because don't you think that if, if, if the devil had any clue at all that Jesus' death would have messed him up, he would have prevented it every means possible. And that would have been, I don't know how that would have worked out, I can't even I can't forget about it, it blows my mind. He says to Peter, so Peter didn't call Peter the devil, he called him the devil. Get out of here, devil. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Think about this. All in people don't measure their obedience to God based on human realities, based on human circumstances. Boy, we live by our feelings. We were talking about that in love and respect this morning. We want to turn our marriages around, our relationships around. We've got to start putting our marriage and our relationships under the umbrella of Christ. And start exercising the word of God in our relationships instead of feelings. Because feelings get us in trouble, don't they? Not that feelings in themselves are wrong, but when we respond or rather react to our feelings, we can get ourselves into deep trouble. So <laughs> Peter speaks up and he says, well, you know, most of us, because wait a minute, they can't imagine this picture with Jesus not there. We're going to go and, and beat on some Romans. We're going to go slap around some Sadducees. <laughs> you know, we got some Pharisees. i got some names of Pharisees we're going to take care of, right, Jesus? I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And he said, Peter obviously is not getting it. We know they don't get it even in the, the upper room and the last, uh, what we now know as the Lord's Supper, the Passover meal they shared before the garden and before the crucifixion. And I love this because all in people understand the Lordship of Christ. Christ understood the Lordship of His Father in heaven. He has come here to obey His Father. He said, I don't say anything unless the Father says it, and I don't do anything unless the Father says it. But many of us in this room, many of us know Christians who live according to my feelings, my opinions, regardless of what the spoken word, the written word says, it's my feelings because I'm the Lord of me and you just sometimes. Just get me into heaven. You see, thank God that Jesus is an influence by the things around him. Get thee behind me, Satan. And what I think is also because then he flips a switch. It's not enough. It's already overwhelming to wrap our heads around the fact that you have to die, Jesus. But then he goes and adds insult to injury. And this is going to be an insult and an injury to you and me because if you keep living according to selfish pride, selfish ambition, human understanding and rationale, you will be offended by what Jesus is about to say. That's right. There is no quarter for you. There is no wiggle room. There is no safe word for you. This is the reality. This is what it means to be a disciple. That's it, he says. But what I love about it, it's on the other end of a statement about what he already knows about himself. I'm all in. What about you? I love this understanding here. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, whoever, this is a general call, ladies and gentlemen, whoever wants to be my disciple must, three things, say three things. Deny themselves. Boy, we could spend it. how many months on that, Pastor? That is the hardest thing. <coughs> Two pieces of cake. One's bigger, the other one's a little smaller. <coughs> Two people want this cake. You eyeballed it. Well, we got this when we were kids. That's the bigger piece. Let me go first. Let me go first. Would mom, if mom just turned... Bob, you got the bigger piece. Then we bring that into a jelly. It's all about me. All about me. You don't even sing that song. Well, no, you don't know the actual song. But me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. You see, we deny. We don't know how to deny ourselves. We know how to deny other people. But to deny ourselves, oh, that's a work. 
That's a word. But then it goes on to hurt us even further. He says that take up their cross. Boy, we can wear crosses. And we can have crosses in church. This church got two crosses here. There's a cross out in the front. Any more crosses? There's crosses all over the place. So of course we're, we're following that scripture, right? We're taking it up, right? I had a guy once who was in ministry. He wore a cross like this big around his neck and he kept complaining about back aches. <laughs> <laughs> Lay down your cross, brother. <laughs> You see, when he said this, obviously he had a reference in mind himself. His disciples had no clue yet, but he was going to be crucified right. on a tree. A piece of wood strung out. And so he says to take up their cross. He wasn't saying that they all need to go and get crucified physically, but yet when you read in Romans about water baptism, it represents that we have died. We've been crucified with Christ. And yet here we are, we still live. I don't got no holes in my hand. I don't have no hole in my side. I don't got no thorn or crowns on my head. But yet I identify myself having been crucified with Christ. When I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, I identified with the finished work of Calvary. I don't got to go get home on a cross. Yeah. Now in the Philippines, they do this every year. They do a big thing and people are selected. It's a, it's a big honor. And they go ahead and reenact, physically reenact, the crucifixion with these, these fellas. And all hung on, 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 on the cross. That's not what he meant. He meant in your life. You have to, you have to die to yourself. <laughs> a Sunday school teacher asked his class, if I sold my house and my car, had a big garage sale and gave all my money to the church, would I get into heaven? No, the children all answered. If I cleaned the church every day, mowed the yard, kept everything neat and tidy, would that get me into heaven? And the class said, no. Again, the teacher said, well, then, if I was kind to animals, all animals, and gave candy to all children, and loved my wife, would that get me into heaven? And all the children said, no. Well, what will get me into heaven? And a five-year-old boy shouted out, you got to be dead. <laughs> he understood. <laughs> Deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. You see, that is the crux of the Christian work, the Christian journey. And it's a journey. It doesn't happen overnight, my Lord. It doesn't happen in a year's time. It happens over a period of one's life where you, be, you experience a transformational work of God. When you say you are saved, when you say you've been born again, not that everything's perfect, but there are things that should fall in line according to the Word of God if He's the Lord of all. Here's the phrase, if Jesus is not Lord of all, then he isn't Lord at all. Many people believe that they are following Jesus, but they have mistakenly invited Jesus to follow them. I enjoy Facebook staying in touch with different friends around the, the country, ministry and whatnot. But I will never like the 50,000 things that come passing down the thing. Copy and paste or whatever it is you're supposed to do. All these different things. And just because I don't like a picture of Jesus does not make me the Antichrist. <laughs> but I'd rather live for Jesus than hit the like button on Facebook. <clears throat> An interesting thing about living for Jesus that it doesn't have to come with public proclamation. That was the problem with the Pharisees. You don't need to broadcast it. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, on Facebook today, let me tell you how I live for Jesus. No, but it is plain to see who's a follower. The fruit will follow them who believe. The scripture says, powerful understanding here. For whoever, verse 35, wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? I'm going to ask Paul and Melanie, uh, Paul and, uh, and Julia. Sorry, Melanie's not playing today. <laughs> Paul and Julia to come to the piano and get ready to sing something. But I want to do something before Pastor comes and leads us 
in communion. I want, I want to, I want to walk you through something real quick. See, because to be all in, it doesn't matter what we're about to say next week or the weeks after about being all in if you don't do the first thing. You see, you cannot, we cannot expect you to be a follower of Christ if you did not actually ask Him to come into your heart. If you have not actually taken the moment to recognize that I have a need of a Savior, that I actually identify myself with the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Easter is coming and we'll all be celebrating it. But wouldn't it be nice that you can actually celebrate it on the other side of the cross? Instead of adoring it from this side, unsaved, having passed through the work of salvation, the grace of God, the love of Christ. Now all of a sudden Easter becomes something awesome. I love Easter because it's my first birthday. <coughs> April 12, 1982. Hello. You say, Matt, why do you remember? Because it was outside of getting married, second most amazing day of my life, and the second time in my life publicly that I weeped like a baby, uncontrollably. Snots and boogers everywhere. <laughs> oh. Two times in my life when I got saved, I boogered on the priest, the preacher. And when I got married, I boogered on myself. <laughs> Two most important days. But I remember that as it was yesterday because it was the day that I realized I needed a Savior. It was the day of the day, first day of the rest of my eternity that I'm going to live for Jesus Christ. Oh, that it is. In fact, the hardest part about being a Christian is church. Why? Because we all get this idea that we all should have wings already. And Red Bull says you should have wings if you drink that. We don't have wings and we're not finished. And though we're called saints, we still don't live enough. So we become impatient with each other. The Word of God helps us how to handle that. Don't let it not getting involved in church and giving your heart to the Lord be because of the sin of other people because you will stand before God yourself and give an answer. And he's not going to hear, well, all right, yeah, you're right, they were screwed up over there, I'm sorry, here, you can come in anyways. It's not what he's going to say. Each one of us will stand before him and give an account for himself. The reason why we won't collect these cards until the end of every service is because there might be something you need to write down to reply. Please pray for it. Or I want to get connected with. Give me information. But also because of this prayer in the back. And I would like, if you have your connect card, to take it out. And I want everyone to look at that prayer in the back. Pastor put this prayer together some time ago. It's called the Believer's Prayer. You came from other church experiences where they had a certain prayer, a specific prayer for certain things. I'm going to tell you that there's not a specific prayer to ask Jesus into your heart. But something like this works. You don't have to pray this exact prayer and that's the only way you're saved. No, you simply need to acknowledge the fact that you need Jesus. That Jesus died for you, took your place. And that you're asking him into your heart. And you declare him to be the Lord of your life. And you thank him for the work of Calvary. That's, that's something like that in your words. I love it. We can live for Jesus and use our own words. And so I'm going to ask everyone at this moment, before we take communion, just to look at this prayer. And whether you're born again, you are not too sure, or you're not, I'd like us, if you're not, you'd like to give your heart to the Lord. I want us all together to read this. We're going to read this out loud. But if you are the first time this you are praying a prayer to accept Jesus Christ in your life, in your heart, I want you to mark that little box. And when you leave today, they have something for you in the back. And then I or one of my uh, associates will be getting a hold of you, following up, trying to help you understand what it really means to follow Jesus Christ. So if everyone please, in a somber moment, right now, no one moving around, I want us to see this prayer. And let's read it out loud together with some music in the backdrop. I really like that. Here we go. Dear Father, together, dear Father in heaven, please forgive me for all my sins. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He paid the penalty for all my sin with His blood on the cross. I turn away from my life of sin and I call upon the name of Jesus to save me now. By faith, I invite the Holy Spirit to come into my life and guide me. I want to trust and follow Jesus for the rest of my life. Now I receive 
receive forgiveness. Now I am a child of God. With the free gift of God's grace, I will live eternally. Thank you, Father, for saving me. This I pray in the name of Jesus, my Lord. Amen.